Meanwhile, I'm back there praying, Lord, please don't let me mess this up. <laughs> if you'd like to follow along with me this morning, uh, I'm going to be in the uh, book of Galatians, chapter 5. Galatians, chapter 5. I was reading a uh, book about uh, World War II. I'm not really a, a big history buff or anything, but uh, when you're preaching... Everything's an illustration, so um, you always have to be feeding on things and and reading things and understanding and trying to uh, form them into lessons and things of that. So I was reading um, about World War II, about the Malaysian uh, islands out in the South Pacific, um, which is off the coast of Australia there, during World War II. And um, the natives watched as the American and British engineers came in and cleared land and started putting in airstrips. And they watched it very uh, curiously because they've never seen such a thing. But then something amazing happened. Planes started coming out of nowhere. I mean, literally just landing, and they were bringing food. They were bringing cargo. They were even bringing vehicles. And so the natives got all excited about this. They said, we need to build one of these things. We need to go out there and, and, and chop down these trees and make a path. And so that's what they did. They went out, literally hacked down trees, made this, this runway through the jungle, put um, fires along the, the sides of the runway, like the runway lights. They built grass huts on sticks, and they put a guy up there with coconut halves on his head. For, and they even put bamboo uh, pieces on the top like antennas. And, and they just stepped back and waited for the cargo to come in. But you see, the cargo never came in. The planes never arrived. As far as they could see, though, everything looked the way it was supposed to look. Everything was in its place, exactly as it was supposed to be. But it didn't work. Because see, as the pilots were flying over, They could see a stark difference between what's been laid properly and what's been hacked into the forest. And so they never landed in the bad ones. (laughs) They landed in the good ones. But the reason why I bring that up is, as a minister over the years, I've experienced something that, that has made me, of course, look inward and examine, of course, myself. And that is that many people in the world are doing the same thing the Melanesians were doing back then. And uh, rather than trying to make a mud path, though, through the jungle look like an airstrip, what they're doing is they're trying to make their lives look religious. And uh, behind the scenes, they're not, though. But they're trying to make their lives look religious. And I think what people today are missing is the same thing the Melanesians were missing. And that is that it's it's not the runways and and the control towers that bring in the cargo. It's your relationship with the one who sends the cargo that counts. And over the years I've realized so many Christians are so concerned with how they look to the world. They're so concerned with, am am I acting like a Christian? Am I I looking Christian? But yet, down deep inside, the relationship that should be there, which makes us Christian, is where they struggle. But they focus so much on what it looks like and don't really live it out in the world around them. Paul, in the book of Galatians, is addressing really a group of people that came into the church and tried to teach that there was another way to salvation. And, and so Paul is trying to, to kind of uh, fix this mess that, that, that's been created in, in the Galatian church. And uh, what he's really trying to tell the Galatians and, and you and I as well is that it's not what your life really looks like on the outside. It's what's inside that shapes how you live your life. It's the other way around. You, you can't just look at it and hope. When I was in, in sales, we had this saying, and now it's ridiculous, but you may have heard it if you've ever been in sales, fake it till you make it. You ever heard that? And, and I really believed that, but I didn't make it. <laughs> I faked it good, but I didn't make it. And uh, I realized there's a little, there's something missing there. <laughs> 
Um, and and in, in your Christian life, faking it won't make it, you see. Even if it looks kind of chopped up and messed up and, and wrong on the outside, work on what's on the inside, and that will slowly transform the rest of your, of your life. Uh, it, it's kind of like uh, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7. He says, you know, one day there's going to be some people that are going to come to me and they're going to go, Lord, Lord, didn't I prophesy in your name? Didn't I cast out demons in your name? And in your name, didn't I do great miracles? And you know what he said to him? Yeah, but I don't know you. I mean, you look good on the outside. Let me tell you, people just thought, wow, look at you. Followers of Jesus Christ. You look perfect. But you never came to me. You never spent time on our relationship. I don't know who you are. I don't know who you are. And as a minister, and I'm sure uh, as many of our teachers in, as well, and, and Jeff himself is probably concerned with the same thing every Sunday when he stands up here. Uh, it, how's it going inside at that relationship, that, that transforming relationship with Jesus Christ. How's that going for you? And uh, I guess uh, to, to use the analogy, how, how's your airport? How's your airport? If you look with me, Galatians chapter 5, we're, we're going to kind of go through these verses slowly because uh, there's so much in them. Uh, beginning of verse 16. So we're going to start with just verse 16. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of of the flesh. Now, now at first, that, that sounds like uh, it's, it's saying something that it isn't. And over the years, many people be, be, get com- confused with that. And they say, oh, well, if I walk by the Spirit, I won't have temptation. It's just gone. I don't get tempted. I won't have to worry about, you know, having to slip into sin. I'm good if I walk by the Spirit. But is that, is that the way it works for you? Because it doesn't work that way for me. It doesn't work that way. I still have to deal with temptation. I still have that struggle in my life. I wish it did work that way, but it doesn't. And you see, Paul, in that little verse here, says it in such a way to try to help us understand. He says, walk by the Spirit. Now, how do you walk by the Spirit? You say some magic word and all of a sudden the legs start going? No, right? I think we all know what he's talking about, right? What does walk mean? Live. I heard somebody say it. It means live. So he's not saying walk by. He's saying live your life by the Spirit. And he says, if you do, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Uh, The New American Standard says you will not carry them out. In other words, if you live your life by the Spirit of God, you won't seek out sin. You won't seek to fulfill the desires of the flesh that we all have, that we all struggle with. You won't seek to fulfill them in your life. So how do you walk? How do you walk by the Spirit? Well, actually, it's, it's not as difficult as it sounds. The first, one, first step, there's actually four that, that I believe are part of walking in the Spirit. The first one is very important, and that is being conscious of the presence of God in your life every day. So many Christians get caught up in living work life and then Sunday's God life. But you see, God's there the entire way. He's working with you. Uh, he's there with you and your family on vacations. And so being conscious of the presence of God every single day is so important. It's so much a, a, really the starting point of walking in the Spirit, living your life in the Spirit, being conscious that I'm never alone. From the moment I came up out of the waters of baptism, I'm never alone. God is with me every step of the way. I need to be conscious of that. The second thing is we need to be in constant communication with God. We need to be talking to him. It, 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 your father wants to hear from you the same way your, your other family members do. Stop calling them and see what happens. They will get with you and they will let you know how upset they may be with you because you haven't contacted them in a while to communicate. 
that your Father in heaven is the same way. He wants to hear from you. And it's a very, very important part of that relationship. Third, spending time in his word. We learn so much from God's word. I, I had a minister, a preacher actually, who was also a professor of mine in college. And he would always say, I don't know how many times I've heard it, but over and over he said, every time I look at this passage, I see something else. I see something new. Because when God changes me, he changes how I see. And so every time I look at this passage, there's something new for me there. You know, so as a Christian, you can never stop learning what God has for you through his word. So take the time, spend the time in that. And then, uh, of course, the last thing, the fourth thing, and I think this is something that many Christians neglect. Listen to the spirit of God within you. Listen to the Spirit of God. He's the one that knows what's right for you and what's wrong for you. And he's the one that will warn you when situations arise that are are not what God would have for your life. And so listen to him when he speaks to you. And if you live, he says, by the Spirit, in other words, you live in that presence of God, then you will not seek to carry out these deeds of the flesh. Unfortunately, being temptation-free is not an option. But if you're living your life in the Spirit of God, then you will not seek to fulfill those evil desires and the desires of the flesh. Look at verse 17. Verse 17, my sight's a little bad today. Uh, oh, wow, I must be getting older, so I notice I read farther away now. Is that, is that what? Oh, boy, okay. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They're in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. Well, that makes sense. You like apple trees? I jumped off that real quick, didn't I? But but for a reason, for a reason. Apple trees, I love apples, but uh, there's something that, that you should never, ever do with an apple tree, and that's plant it near another tree, a red cedar tree. Did you know that? If you do, then there's this cycle of disease called the cedar apple rust that they get every year. I didn't know this. Living up north for 10 years there, we learned this. Uh, every year when the apples grow, they get um, a brown rot. But at the same time, the red cedar tree gets a, a slimy orange canker on it. Because you see, these two trees are in complete opposition to each other. And as long as they're together, they will never, ever uh, get rid of this disease. And the fruit will never grow on the apple tree until one of them is either cut down or dies. That's just the way it is. Paul says, the spirit and the flesh is the same way. They're so contradictory. They, they, there's such opposition to one another. They cannot dwell together. They cannot peacefully coexist. That's why we have that battle within us. Because there's two things trying to live in you that just can't coexist. And so there's this constant fight. Because life lived by the Spirit does not cooperate with the desires of the flesh. It just doesn't happen. And so that battle within us. And, uh, in, in fact, Paul says in, in Romans chapter 7, don't tell Jeff I was in Romans, please. All right, you get me in trouble. But uh, he says in, in Romans chapter 7, let me get there real quick. Romans chapter 7 verse 15. He says this, he says, um, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, that I do. It was the battle within him. That struggle within him that, in fact, in the 24th verse of that very same chapter, let's see. He says, what a wretched man that I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? So the struggle within me. So if you're there this morning, and many of us probably are experiencing some kind of struggle some kind of, uh, of temptation that you maybe been dealing with all week, then, uh, you know, rest at ease. You're not alone. Take heart. You have a lot of people with you because we all experience the same struggle. We all have that battle within us. It's part of what being a Christian is all about, folks. And uh, the only way that we're going to keep the upper hand in this battle is to walk in the Spirit, being conscious of God, 
spending time in his word, spending time in prayer, and listening to the spirit within us when he tells us what's right and when he tells us what's wrong. Uh, Look at uh, verse 19. Let's jump into verse 19 of our our text this morning here. Um, The acts of the flesh are obvious. He says they're obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. He said these these are obvious. These are obvious. But notice how he ends it. He says, and the like. In other words, there's more. That's not the whole list. That's not exhaustive. There's a lot more. And they all seem just like that. And they're all obvious to the Spirit of God within you. He knows what they are because they are in opposition to Him. And He knows how to warn us against them. That's why we have to listen to the Spirit of God within us. Because the Spirit knows who's for God and who's against God. Then he goes into uh, a little warning there. Verse 21, he says, um, I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now notice, he didn't say those who do these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. He said those who live like that will not inherit the kingdom of God. See, so he, God understands that you and I are struggling in this world. He understands that we are flesh and that we are weak and there are times in life when you and I will fail. We're not perfect and we will fail. And he understands that. So he gives us the spirit of God within us to help us fight the fight, to fight that battle within us. So when these things do come, we have the strength to say no. We have the strength to walk away. Now, this doesn't give us permission to sin because, you know, God knows I'm going to. But it, it, it basically just a, to, helps us to recognize the changing grace of God in our lives. It works through the power of the Holy Spirit. It, it basically just bringing us along, so to speak, changing us little by little into the image of Christ. Kind of working through us from the inside out. Guiding us through life. It's a learning experience. It's a growing experience. Not something instantaneous. Well, I hoped the first time when I, when I, when I started coming to church and I, I made that decision, I was going to give my life to the Lord. I hoped that it would be a miraculous change. And then I would just be Mr. Good Christian all of a sudden. And it didn't work that way. It wasn't this magical changing thing that I had hoped that it would be. But all of a sudden, though, I became now conscious of the battle. Before that, I didn't even know I was was in any kind of fight. But the moment that the Spirit of God came within me, my eyes began to open up and I began to see that, hey, there's a fight going on in here. There's a battle waging within me. It's a battle that that I don't want to lose. It's a battle that I need to lean on the Spirit for to help me get through it. And He will, and He will. He doesn't, God doesn't expect us to, uh, to, to, to lead perfect lives. But he does expect us to strive for the best we can and to fight the good fight. He's not standing there waiting for you to fail so he can hit you over the head. Uh, that's not the God we serve. But he does expect us to grow. He does expect us to continue uh, in, our, in our growth, in our walk. Then in in verse 22, he jumps into the wonderful fruit of the Spirit. And I'm just going to read through. He says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And let me tell you right now, though, because this is, I think, where a lot of people struggle, is these are not seeds to be planted in your life. Some Christians treat these as if these are things I can plant in my life. And so they focus on these things and say, okay, I need to plant love and joy and peace. I need these things, I need to plant them in my life because that way I'll be a Christian. But that's not the way it works. Because you see, we don't produce these things. 
The Spirit of God produces these things. So you, you basically are looking to Him in your life to produce the fruit of your life. And when we try to do it another way, all we're doing is trying to plant seeds. That It's like taking an, a, 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 an apple or a pear or, or whatever, planting the whole thing in the ground, just hoping it's going to grow. They usually don't. Sometimes you might get lucky, but they usually don't. Like I said, it's the changing grace of God that is slowly moving you within your life, working through your life, changing you. And it takes that time. And uh, they're not seeds that you can plant. They're fruit that is produced, and it's produced through the Spirit of God within you. You don't do that yourself. Uh, these, they're, they're the results of your salvation. They're not the seeds to grow your salvation. It's impossible. It's impossible. Um, the Spirit produces them, not you and, and not me. Verse uh, 24 of our, our, our text there, he says, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. He says, we've, we've crucified. Now, when you think about that, you think, okay, so if I've crucified the flesh, then I shouldn't have to deal with the lusts and the, and the, 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 the temptations and the struggles of life, right? Because I've crucified that li- that." The old man, if you would have sinned, I've crucified that. But yet, he's still there. And yet, we still struggle with him, don't we? Even though he's been crucified. In, in, uh, again, in the book of Romans. In, uh, I, I'm, I'm not really jumping too much into it, but it's kind of hard to leave the book of Romans out. So, here we go. Uh, chapter 6, verse 3 and following, it says this. He says, um, Do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in in the death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. So we've we've crucified it. We haven't killed it, but we've crucified it, and we're still going to struggle with it. But the moment that you were lowered in the baptism, the moment that you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, God sent his spirit as a guide, as a gift. And it's from that point when you renounce the hold that the old man of flesh has upon you. And you declare freedom in Christ. It's not instantaneous. Uh, I, I remember um, uh, William Wallace as he screams out, freedom! It's a fight. Nothing like that will ever be free, folks. It will be a fight every step. Of the way, and I, I love the exhortation that Paul gives us in verse um, twenty-five of our text this morning. He says, "Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit." the The, the words there that are, that are used, I really like how he he uses Paul's very good with using words. Uh, and the first word for "live" there is is uh, the Greek word "zomen," which literally means "live." It means "live." All right. Uh, I mean, sorry, it means life, life. And the other one that, that he uses for walking, and, you know, uh, when he says in it, there to, uh, um, keep, uh, keeps us in step, he says there, uh, is the word uh, stoichsomen, which literally means to live. So really what he's saying, he says, since we already have life through the Spirit, let's live according to the Spirit. You see, because the Spirit is the one who gives us life to begin with. God sends His Spirit, and that is the beginning of a new life. And so, since we've already received life, He says, now live your life according to that Spirit. Live your life according to the guiding that He gives you in your life, and you will be fine. You will struggle, but you will be fine. Like I said, uh, this isn't something that we can plant. This isn't something we can grow. This isn't something we can pretend and all of a sudden it'll be there. You can't fake it to make it. This is something that the Spirit of God within you will produce as you spend time with God. 
as you nurture the spirit and the relationship within you. You can't pretend for it to be there and hope it works. Because the blessings and the, the fruit, the, the cargo planes won't come. They won't come unless you have the proper relationship in place. And that's why so many Christians struggle in their, their religious lives because they're going about it the wrong way. They're trying to look religious in the hopes that they become religious. And it's not possible, not the way God intended it to be. The Spirit of God comes into you, and you don't look religious, believe me. I'm not saying you, but when he first starts. <laughs> I should have said that a different way, huh? <laughs> but we don't start out looking religious. In fact, we, we start out looking like children trying to walk, right? And every few feet we're, we're on our face, right? We struggle with learning how to live, and that's the way it looks. Don't worry about what the world sees in you as long as you're living in the Spirit of God. Don't worry about what the world says about you as long as what God says about you is in sync with the Spirit that he gave you. Allow the Spirit to guide you through life. Allow him to, to get the airport in order so the cargo can come in in your life. Uh, so here's the question. Every, every Preacher has to ask, so what, right at the end? Uh, so what? Uh, when you look at the airport, which is your life, how does it look? How does it look? I mean, is it all straightened up and clean and waiting for the cargo that God has to come in? Or does it look more like somebody's hacked this thing out of a jungle somewhere? Uh, and you're not really sure if the planes can really land. How does that look in your life? Are you walking by the Spirit of God? I mean, literally, really, really walking by the Spirit of God? Are you aware of God's presence in your life every day? Everywhere you go, He's right there with you. He's that friend that walks along beside you. Are you talking to Him every day, communicating with Him about the things that matter to you, the things that are going on in your life? Are you spending time in his word, feeding on it and learning from it? Because there's so much there for us. That's what it's for. God gave it to us for this purpose. And are you listening to the spirit of God within you as he speaks to you? Because he will warn you when things are wrong. And he will celebrate with you when things are right. But we have to hear what he has to say. And if we do that, Paul says you won't seek to carry out the, the, the deeds of the flesh. You won't seek to carry out the desires of evil. But rather, the Spirit of God within you will begin to produce amazing fruit. And you will begin then to look the way you really are inside. You heard the, uh, the, the story of the ugly duckling, right? You know, she's so ugly. All the other ducks, you're so ugly. But inside, she was beautiful. She was beautiful because she was kind and loving and wonderful. And she would be a perfect friend for anybody. But she was ugly, according to the world. But you know what happened to her? The outside finally caught up with the inside. And the next thing you know, she's extremely beautiful. And all the swans want her to be part of, of their group because she is so beautiful. That's how God does it with you and me. We don't look so good when we start. But as we live in the Spirit of God, He changes us. Let the outside catch up on its own, folks. Work on the inside. Work on your relationship with the Spirit of God. Let Him change you. Because He's promised He will. Maybe you're here today and you're not a Christian. I, I've been down both roads. I've traveled down both roads quite a ways. I've experienced both lives I guess to the extreme. Uh, and I know how hard it is to turn all control over to God. And, and I think that's why he gave us the spirit to begin with. Because it's so hard for you and me to let go. And just say, okay, here it is, God, you can have it all. That's a hard thing to do. Because you find yourself doing what? Taking things back. Oh, wait, 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 you, you can't have that, God. Maybe later, not right now, God. And oh, oh and, and I need to control this, God. And we hold on to the things in our life rather than letting God have them. And I think he knows that. 
And so as he gives us the spirit, the spirit's working. He's behind the scenes. He's cleaning the bedroom. He's cleaning the bathroom. He's straightening up the silverware. and We don't even really notice he's doing it. And he's slowly working within us. Folks, when you become a child of God, you don't have to miraculously change everything in your life. In fact, it's impossible. You can't do it. But God will change those things if you look to him every day. If you look to him. Maybe you've never done that. Maybe you've never looked to God and say, okay, God, this is not working for me. I know that one day you're going to come, and when you do, this is not going to work. I'm going to be in a lot of trouble. But I know you've spent, you sent your spirit, and I know you sent him for a reason, to help me become like Jesus, to change me slowly, not all at once, but slowly, so that I can become what you want me to be. Maybe you're here today and you've never made that step, never made that decision. I'd love to sit down with you and talk about that because I went through a struggle that took a while for me to finally let God have the rest of it. It's a battle that you don't really want to fight. But it's a battle that you don't have to fight because the Spirit of God will help you slowly let go. You ever seen those? I'm going to step down. hope you don't mind. I'm a walker. I don't know. Have you ever seen those movies that, that when they downsize? Uh, it's, not, it's a show on TV where, the, where they call them tiny houses. And they have to let go of things. You see the struggle on people's faces when they say, whoa, and he, he draws a circle on the floor and he says, okay, put the stuff you want to keep in that circle. The rest of it goes. And they start putting their stuff in there. And then they go, oh, we're out of room. And, wait, wait, and they pull this one out and they put this one in. Oh, no, 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 wait, wait. And they pull this one out and they put this one in. Then they say, well, can we just stack them up? He goes, no, you can't do that. And you can see the distress. You can see, that was me. I came to this church in 1988, I think it was. And I sat there. There were pews here at that time. And uh, I held on to that pew like this. And my knuckles were as white as white could be because I couldn't let go. I knew it. I was, no, God, you want everything. I can't give you everything. I can't let go. And then I found out the truth. You don't have to let go. You don't. God will help you through his spirit. And slowly, you won't need it anymore. You have those things in your house, and you look at it, you go, why do we keep this? We don't even use it. And you get rid of it. That's what he does. He helps you to get to that point when you realize you don't need it. You really don't. We're going to sing an invitation hymn.